Echo, Part 7 Concerning the late Robert Smith Wow, Clint hadn't been lying after all. What? Leo whispers it at me from across the table, not looking up from his phone. Nothing, just finding some interesting stuff. I whisper back. Good. Leo grins, but still doesn't look up from his phone. There isn't much to go off of. After reading through it, I'm pretty sceptical of Haunted Echo, the main source of my documentary. Well, at least a bit of information I just came across references some newspaper articles from 1952. The young wolf named Robert Smith wasn't even a resident of Echo. He'd been resting at the Echo classification yard after taking a train from the capital. He was on his way to the west coast and, once he thought he'd found the right train, he attempted to board it. No one knows exactly what happened, but somehow his train hopping went horribly wrong and he was found with both limbs severed two hours later. He'd managed to crawl twenty yards north up along the rail before he was found. Somehow, impossibly, he survived the ordeal up to that point. This was mainly due to the mud packs that had been placed on the stumps, halting the bleeding. Of note was the fact that Robert had seemingly become delirious because of the blood loss, pain, trauma, or likely a combination of all three. He claimed that the bleeding had been stopped by a creature of some kind. When he tried to describe it, he began to sob and scream incoherently. It's hard to say how much of this has been exaggerated by the author. Either way, I don't exactly have time to track down all of her sources, so I decide I'll just have to trust it. My leg jumps as something soft and ticklish brushes up against it. I snap my gaze up at Leo. What? Leo gives me an innocent look while he continues to brush his tail up against my leg. Well, if you're not going to say anything, then please stop doing that. It's distracting. He does stop then, and I feel a little guilty, so I look back up. And thanks for getting a library card just so I could check this out. It's a huge help. He smiles. No problem, Nutria. Not one of your sexier words. I return back to the book. It's unlikely that Robert would have survived anyway due to the extent of his injuries and infection. Still, it is of note that he ended up committing suicide a few hours after discovery. He apparently slipped out the fifth floor window of the Peyton Regional Medical Centre. The authorities simply dismissed it as a case of a man knowing his demise was nigh and finishing the job himself. The author speculates that it had something to do with the horrors he saw on the tracks. I hear a soft whine coming from in front of me and I lower the book to find Leo draped across the table on his chest. He's looking up at me with huge puppy eyes. I can't help but smile because it's so fucking adorable, even for a wolf as big as him. What? I have a project to do, remember? Yeah, I know, but we've been here for three hours now. You should take a break. I look at the time and I'm shocked that he's actually right. How the hell did that happen? Well, I guess that's a good idea. I was just finding some really interesting stuff. I'm sure that project of yours is going to turn out awesome. He grins and stands up abruptly, grabbing my book up as well so I couldn't continue to read. Let's go get some lunch. It's already almost three. All right. Did you want to go to the diner? Do you want to eat there? Well, it's been a few days. I'd like to catch up with the others, you know. I know that's what you wanted to do. Actually, everyone's busy. I already tried. Oh, really? What are they doing? Well, Flynn's working... TJ and Jenna are on a hike and Carl's asleep. Oh. It doesn't really seem like Leo to just blow off meeting up with everyone, but I guess at this point in the trip he's just tired of trying. I know I would be. Probably just to show me up after what I said last night, Leo takes me to a semi-fancy steakhouse. He, of course, insists on paying for everything. I'm not really sure when Leo became so concerned with how I perceive his income. I don't mind, though. The meal is good. I'm happy not to pay the $30 price tag. It does remind me of his job, though, so I ask him about his schedule. He says his parents gave him the entire week off, which surprises me. I remember how Leo worked almost every day in that shop. I guess his dad is just mellowing out with age. 
Again, I have no reason to complain though. On the way back, Leo nudges me as I'm nodding off and gestures out his window. Peyton, hi. Sure enough, our old school is visible out the window. Want to swing round? Just to look at it. Yeah. I'm tired, but we're not doing anything else. All right, why not? It's past five at this point, and as we pull into the parking lot, there are only a few cars scattered around. We walk around the side of the school, then onto the football field. If Peyton High School put its money anywhere, it was definitely sports. That was one of the reasons I was so mediocre by comparison. Every sport in the school was extremely competitive, each one winning state regularly. They win state again since they've been gone? Nope. Came close last year, though. Almost as close as we did back in 09. Ah, yeah. You still sore about that? Leo sits down on the bottom bench of the concrete bleachers and I sit down next to him. Sometimes. Mostly because we were so damn close and it really just feels like it was yesterday. It does kind of feel that way. I can remember it pretty clearly. It was the first and last time I'd seen Leo really cry. He'd wanted that championship so bad. I lean back and look around, breathing in deeply. Wow, it's really nostalgic being here, isn't it? Leo looks off towards the sunset. I can see him getting glassy-eyed. Is it weird that if I could, I'd go through high school again? I think for a moment. Not really. I'd like to do it. I made a lot of mistakes. Well, not really because of that. More like it was a lot of fun. I just want to experience it all again. I grin at him. Hey, you're talking like you peaked in high school. Did I? The question catches me completely off guard, and my stumbling around for words that follows doesn't help. No! no, no. He sighs. Leo, you got a good paying job, your own house, a pretty damn good life. You're doing better than most. He laughs a little. I guess I just don't feel like it, you know? Why not? He leans back. Well, I don't really feel as good as I did back then. When I think of high school or even further back. Man, those were the good days. I think about how completely inverse I am to that. How my life improved exponentially after I left the town. Well, you know, if you keep looking back, I don't think you'll ever be happy. He looks so sad, I wrap an arm around his shoulders which is a little difficult considering how broad they are. Because five years from now, you'll probably look back on this era of your life and think, man, I wish I could go back. Heh, <laughs> you're probably right. So let's just enjoy now. Leo sighs again, then looks straight down at me, meeting my eyes. Chase? Yeah? He pauses, looking off to the side before turning his eyes back on mine. I love you. I immediately look away. Chase, please. Please, just come back. I miss you so much. Every day. I stare out across the field, not able to meet his eyes again. I'll stop smoking. I'll stop picking on Clint. I'll get rid of the gun. Just please come back. I just... I don't know, Leo. You know how I don't like it there. And I feel like I should keep my options open to find a good job, a good place to live. Just for a year or two, while you're getting on your feet, I'll give you a place to stay. That sounds great, Leo. But to get back together? It's like setting ourselves up for another breakup. I don't want to do that. But then we know for sure, without parents or school in the way. It'll just be us, and then, if it doesn't work out, there's some closure there. For the first time, I feel myself seeing things from Leo's point of view. I'm not necessarily losing anything by at least trying. And he's right, there really wasn't any closure, mostly because of me. 
Leo must sense my indecision because he immediately presses forward. And I'll be making enough to support you while you figure things out. Hey, I don't want to mooch. I don't mind. I just want you to be comfortable so you can do whatever you want to do. But, Echo. Leo's quiet for a while. A long while before he finally speaks up. Now that I can't fix. But I guess one way to decide is to weigh what's more important to you. You're asking me to choose. I... I'm not asking that, exactly. Leo glances at me. But if I did? I blow out a long sigh. So you are? He doesn't say anything, so my mind starts wandering over the years we'd spent together. Despite how much we fight, there's no question in my mind what the answer is, and it hits me like a thunderbolt. Well, I choose you. All at once, his face explodes into a grin. So much happiness in one expression, I don't think I'd ever be able to take back what I just said, even if I wanted to. And instantly I'm wrapped up in a tight, warm hug, one that crushes the air from my lungs. Oh my god, Chase, I I love you so fucking much. Hey, but you've still got a year of school left, so we're going to have to get back into contact, and we're going to have to exchange... I clasp his muzzle shut with my hand around it, and he just stares back at me with wide eyes. I didn't even say yes. I take my hand away from his muzzle. Oh, well, what do you say? I look again to the sunset, past the concrete bleachers and goalposts, in the direction of Echo and take a deep breath. I look back at Leo. Yes. And then he's kissing me. It's not rough like it was at the train yard. His mouth stays closed, but he holds my head gently, and it's like he's trying to pour all of his love into me through just his lips. As ridiculous as it might sound, I can feel it. Leo's heavy, soft body presses me into the bed, licking and kissing up my neck. His hands slide up and down my body, feeling out everything, and he's gasping like he can't catch his breath. I lay there. My eyes shut as I feel his cock pressing up against mine, writhing every time Leo reaches down to grasp them together. I slide my own hands down his back until they reach his rear, and I squeeze hard under his tail, forcing another gasp out of the big wolf. Slowly he starts to lick down the length of my body, starting with my chest, then down my stomach. He pauses to snuffle and tease against my navel before his mouth finally closes around me. My eyes roll back as I clutch into the sheets, arching my back. I listen as Leo showers down the hall, and I smile as I hear him singing. I'd usually shower with him back in the day, but I was so tired I passed out as soon as we both finished. Once I opened my eyes again, Leo was already in the shower. Mm. I'm about to drift off again when I hear Leo's phone buzz. He'd been on it all day, probably trying to coordinate a meeting with the others. It's already Friday, which is hard to believe. We had to get together again before we lost a chance. Mm. I look over. The screen is already lit up, so I sit up and look. A message from Flynn. Yeah, well, fuck you too. Not exactly a surprising message you get from Flynn. I still wonder what they're fighting about. From the sounds of it, Leo is still in the middle of his shower, still rocking out his diva pop song. I really don't want to breach any trust on the first day of our new relationship. No, Leo deserved better. I lay back, smiling, somewhat proud of myself for resisting the temptation. I decide I'll just ask him when he gets back. I know Leo, and I know he wouldn't hide anything from me if he didn't have to. I lay back with a sigh, content for the first time this week. I sit on hard, uneven ground, shivering as I try to cover myself up with a blanket. My eyes are just enough for me to realise that I'm outside somewhere, looking through the branches of dead trees to the many stars above me. 
Aside from the calls of a few birds, it's completely silent. I stare at the sky above me for a while, wishing it wasn't so cold so I could go back to sleep. Where am I? The slight confusion I feel mixed in with the apathy of just waking up is a familiar feeling. I can remember when my parents forced me into Boy Scouts ten years ago. I hated it so much, especially the camping. I could never fall asleep, and when I finally did, it would be marred by me tossing and turning, waking up in confusion as to where I was. I'd sit up straight in the tent, looking around me for up to ten minutes, wondering why I was in complete darkness and sitting in a sleeping bag. Except now there's no tent or sleeping bag. My mind works slowly like it's drenched in molasses, and I knead the ground with my fingers, digging into the dead vegetation and soil. And then finally, I break through the barrier to lucidity and I realise that what's happening to me is real. I'm outside. I look left and right and see that I'm surrounded by trees or bushes. The smell of sagebrush and dirt fills my nostrils as I unsteadily get to my feet. My limbs and flesh are numb from the cold and I rub my hands up and down my arms, trying to find some warmth. Did I sleepwalk? I must have, unless Leo took me out here for some reason. Or someone else did? I shiver. There's not much else I can do except walk forward. Ahead of me it looks like the branches clear out into more darkness. I hope that I'm just behind Leo's house where I know there are some bushes and trees. Either way, I can't be that far from the house. So I start walking, reaching out blindly to move past sharp branches and prickly bushes. The pain wasn't that bad. Not nearly as bad as you think it'd be. I look back behind me, staring hard into the blackness. I can't see anything beyond the branches right in front of me, which give the impression of gnarled teeth in front of a dark, endless mouth. Quickly, I turn back around and push through the dead vegetation in front of me, trying not to panic. But I knew I was dead the moment I looked down. A branch scrapes across my cheek, and another stabs me hard in the hip as I run right into it. Two stumps gushing blood, splashing the wheels of train and rails. I finally break out into the open. Now I can see more stars above me, but the complete lack of a moon makes almost everything around me impossible to see. I can at least tell it's a large clearing, but no matter how hard I squint, I can't see ahead of me. Tentatively, I start walking forward, looking left and right for any signs of lights that might help guide me back to the town. I can feel a worrying seed of panic starting up in my chest, and I worry it's going to explode out of me at any second. The last thing I need is me running through the night screaming my head off. Pretty soon I'd become aware of what looks like a large block in front of me. Again, I reach out my hands, walking slow as I approach whatever it is that's in front of me. They press up against something rough, hard and cold. Whatever it is, it's made of some type of metal. It feels broken and rusted, so I assume it's old. Was it a warehouse of some kind? I sidestep to the right until my hands run up against some bars that stick out from the structure, and that's when it hits me. It's a freight car from the old train. Sure enough, the next thing my hands meet is empty space as I come across what I remember to be the open door I'd sat in earlier. I was out in the train yard. I almost laugh. Did my anxiety about finishing the project cause me to sleepwalk all the way back out here? At least now I know exactly where I am. I rest my hands on the edge of the car, breathing in the musty air inside. There's a hint of something sweet and sick on top of it, and it crosses my mind that anything could have crawled inside and died. I quickly move away from the car. Turning my body in the direction I know Leo's house is in, I start walking again. I pour through my recent memories to see if I could somehow remember how the hell I got here. I remember Leo coming back into the bedroom, putting his arm around me, then... Nothing. I definitely fell asleep. Sleepwalking is the only answer. The sound of rustling behind me makes me jump, but I keep moving forward, not wanting some tiny creature in the grass getting me spooked. Squinting ahead of me, I see no lights yet, which is strange, because I know Echo should 
I have at least a few lights on. The street lights, at least. A loud metallic clang fills the air, and this time I do whirl around. Hello? My voice is still scratchy from waking up, and I cough to clear it. <coughs> Hello? The loudness of my voice actually startles me, the response is silence. Did a bird hit it? Maybe I knocked something loose when I was feeding around. I'm definitely not going back to check it out though, so with a quickened pace I start moving again. That's when I hear more shifting around in the car, like something is rolling around inside. I stop walking again and hold still, perking my ears as I try to hold my breath, heart pounding. This time I don't call out, instead just listen. I swallow and it's so loud I almost jump at that sound. But again the sound stops completely. I wait a while longer for I start moving again, this time at a slight jog. A crazy thought enters my mind where I think maybe Leo and I got really drunk, maybe we both came out here and blacked out. And that Leo is in the train car right now, hung over and rolling around. It's in the middle of that thought though that the sound starts up again. It's louder this time, it ends with it cutting off for a split second while something heavy thuds to the dead vegetation below. I stop again, this time it's so that whatever it is doesn't hear me. I know that if I keep walking the heavy crunches in my footsteps will allow for it to pinpoint me immediately. My throat is completely dry and a new thought enters my mind. It could be Clint. I wouldn't be surprised at all if he comes out here to sleep in the train cars. That would totally be something that he'd do. While it does ease my worries a little bit, I'm not fully relaxed because I know the dumb fuck has a gun. I also know he wouldn't hesitate to shoot at something if it startled him. So I crouch down a bit, waiting, listening, and now I'm pretty sure I can hear breathing. Ragged, wheezy breathing. It definitely sounds like Clint. I gather up some spit in my mouth so my tongue doesn't stick to the roof of it and take a small breath. Hey, Clint? I say it gently, quietly, I'm sure he can hear me. I get some more silence in return, but I also get the distinct feeling that he's listening back. I try again. It's me, Chip. There's an explosion of energy and sound in front of me, but it's not a gunshot. Instead, it's a sense of forward momentum that I can physically feel, that whatever it is is in front of me is lunging forward at me. Two loud thuds, one following the other in less than half a second, followed by an explosive dragging sound. The cycle repeats the second it ends. Whatever it is sounds desperate, almost manic. (laughs) I don't stick around to find out. Before I know it, my legs are carrying me through the clearing as fast as I can. All thoughts of what it could be are gone from my mind as I dodge into the trees and bushes to my right. If I can break through to the other side, I'll be right in front of Leo's house. What's behind me, though, is moving impossibly fast. Already it sounds like the distance between me and it has been cut in half. As I'm struggling between branches and sagebrush, I hear it break into the brush with me. A gasp as full-on panic sets in. Leo! Leo! I scream as loud as I can, knowing that he should be able to hear me. Also knowing that he sleeps like a rock. The thing behind me seems to double its efforts at the sound of my voice, and the cycle of its movement increased. It now has the momentum of a gallop. My breath are coming in panic gasps, and now I know I'm not going to make it because it's only three feet behind me. As if a window opens up in the back of my mind, I see it. Two clawed hands outstretched towards me, a face that flashes past too fast for me to make out, but I manage to see a lipless mouth, and then it slams into my back and crushes me into the ground against sharp branches and rocks. I gasp as the air is crushed out of me, but before I can suck it back in, those hands wrap around my neck. I struggle and pull, but it's like I'm an ant under a foot. I'm so thoroughly pinned that I can't even budge an inch. There's hissing behind my head, and I feel dripping against the back of my neck. Tears squeeze out of my eyes as I try to reach forward, but it's like I'm paralysed. Paralysed. I'm yanked back suddenly, my face coming out of something soft and white. A pillow. Chase! Chase, you okay? Leo's husky voice whispers into my ears as I take in a huge gasp of air. Whoa, can't breathe? I cough and gasp. My face wet with tears, I sit in the bed looking around. Oh baby, it's okay. 
Leo draws me into a warm hug and I take it limply, my mind only now catching up. I cough a few more times. So, sorry. Paralysis. Good move. Leo rocks me a few times, making shushing sounds. I remember you telling me about that. Good thing I was here to pull you out of your pillow. I nod against his chest, realising how dangerous it could have been if he hadn't been there. I usually came out of the paralysis in under a minute, but sometimes... I shudder and pull back out of the hug, wiping my face. What did you dream about? I try to think back, but the dream is fleeing my mind as fast as whatever it was that was chasing me. What was chasing me? I... I can't remember. The ear rubs my shoulder and looks at my face. It's dark, but I can see the white of his eye patches, giving him an almost ghostly appearance. You want to stay up? I can make you tea or something. The adrenaline is already leaving me to be replaced by fatigue, but the offer sounds nice. Sure. All right. Want to come with me? I pause, then shake my head, wanting to collect myself alone for a moment. No, no, just give me a second. All right. Leo leans forward and kisses me on the forehead before leaving me alone in the dark room. I lay back down on my side, trying again to remember what I dreamed about. I was in the woods and something was after me. That's about all I can recall. The warmth Leo left in the bed quickly has me drowsy again, I'm about to drift off when something pokes me in the foot. I try to ignore it, but the thought of an insect of some kind has me reaching down to feel at it. It's hard and crackly, whatever it is, and when I pull it up, I find a dead leaf. Frowning, I pull back the sheets, and there, clinging to the fabric and fur on my feet, is dirt and leaves. I think we need a long pause after that revelation. And I'm not going to say much more. Thanks for listening. Lister.